Have you ever seen the footage of astronauts training for zero gravity in the back of one of those planes? Would it be great to get to do that and even better if you could do it with a moonwalking hero? Well, this week we talked to Christina Corp, whose organization, Space for a Better World, have teamed up with Charlie Duke to offer just that experience. Plus, it's another very busy week in the world of space flight, so we'll do our best to get you up to date. Please do keep getting in touch with us on social media. It really is great to hear from you. We're at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. But right now, whatever you are doing, please enjoy episode 42 of the Space and Things Podcast. Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 42 of this podcast. Uh, how are you doing, Emily? I'm doing great. I'm doing good. Uh, another nice week, one week closer to Space Fest. So I'm very excited. It's going to be hopefully a good summer. Joe, you know what? I'm absolutely gutted I'm not going to see your, your presentation. I really am. Yeah, I'm hoping maybe they'll allow um, somebody to tape it or something. I'm hoping. Last time uh, there was copyright things because they had a musical act. And um, so I don't know if this time will be the same deal, but maybe I'm hoping somebody might record it. Maybe. Hopefully, if it's good. <laughs> Yeah, for all I know, for all I know, it could bomb, and I might not ever be invited back again. (laughs) I'm sure. I'm sure that's not the case. I'm sure that's not the case. I hope not. Yeah. Um. So we did have some sad news this morning, which I wanted to just put up top. Uh, I am embarrassed. I've talked this about this before that I I'm not that good with uh my Russian space history. Um. So I was a bit embarrassed to say I didn't know this person. Uh, but Vladimir Shatilov died today at the age of 93, and he flew three space missions, uh, Soyuz 4, 8, and 10. He commanded them, I believe, and was, at the point of his death, the oldest spacefarer, um, which is now a title which I believe passes on to Frank Borman. But uh, this is, uh, I don't know how much you know about him, Emily, but this, it, obviously a, a, a sad story when, when one, of the, uh, one, one of the OGs, uh, another one of them, has passed away. Yeah, I'm embarrassed to say uh, I know probably much less about Soviet space than I do about American space programs, just because in the West, we didn't really learn much until like the 1980s about um, what they were doing in the Soviet Union. But um, Shatilov, I know he had a really big role in Apollo Soyuz as well. He didn't fly in Apollo Soyuz, but he had a really like if you look at any books about Apollo Soyuz, if you see like the group photos they took with the with the Russian side, he's in all of them. He may, I don't know if he was on the backup crew or not. He may have been or support crew, something like that. But mm-hmm. um, I, I, I can't remember it from memory. Uh, but I, all I know is that he played a huge part in that. And that, and that uh, program is kind of the reason why we're flying together in space today. Even though our nations don't get along very well, um, I, I think we still have a pretty good collaboration in space. So, and he was part of that. So he definitely deserves a lot of accolades and respect for that kind of thing. And plus he was, yeah, he was one of the first cosmonauts. Uh, He wasn't in the Vostok team, but he was, you know, definitely one of the more senior cosmonauts during, you know, the seventies and stuff like that. From what I've learned today, he ended up in a management position. um, Yeah. Once, once he finished flying as well. So yeah, he he would have guided that right the way through. Exactly. Until the end of the Soviet Union, I'm sure. Yeah, I think he played also a huge role in uh, the Salyut program, which were the uh, space stations before Mir. Yeah. And that was pretty important because those were really the first space stations where, you know, they figured, okay, we can put people up there for 100 days at a time. Mm. And that was not just big for the Soviet Union, but that, you know, that also taught us Americans, well, we could do something similar. And we're doing it now with the ISS. So, yeah, he's definitely a big pioneer and this is a huge loss in a uh, space flight and it's it's really weird that frank borman is now the oldest he's he's 93 we need to put him in bubble tape or something <laughs> I, I don't want him to i don't want him to go anytime soon i i love that guy so yeah yeah me too anyway just to recap that's the news that one of the earliest cosmonauts vladimir shatilov died today at the age 93 anyway I think it's time for us to get on with the rest of the show, shall we? Yep, let's get on with it. Ah, 
This week, we have another returning guest, Christina Corp, who joined us back on episode 27 when we had a discussion about how to best serve women in the space industry with her and Mike Mullane. While we touched on some of her own work within that interview, we thought it would be a great idea to get her back on to talk more about Space for a Better World, a company she founded with Sophie Williams to inspire more people to help this planet and using space to do that. So if you follow Christina on social media, you may have recently seen some incredible images of her with astronauts Charlie Duke and Nicole Stott. They went on one of those vomit comets which always is a strange thing to say out loud. (laughs) But, you know, one of those planes which flies in a wave pattern of steep climbs and sharp dives, when, as it turns at the top, those on board will experience some time of weightlessness. So this has been used to train astronauts since the very beginning and also for filming movies like Apollo 13. So I was very keen to find out all about this experience. So let's get on with this interview. And from every window, we have a really spectacular view of the Earth as as well as the... Uh, what surprised me, the real, real blackness of space. I don't think I've ever seen black as it is out here. So, welcome back, Christina Corp. Thank you so much for joining us again. This time to talk about something more about you as well, which is nice. So, please, can you tell us, what is the mission of Space for a Better World? Well, it's a very broad mission. And by the way, thank you very much for having me back. And I appreciate um, you spacey people with all my heart. Um <laughs> So Space for a Better World came out of when we were producing the Apollo 50th Gala. Um, Sophie Williams, my partner in the UK who produced the galas with me, we were having a conversation about um, how a lot of people she dealt with who were more concerned about um, climate change and the environment weren't going to want to support the gala because it was a space theme. Mm. And that basically there would be a lot of people talking about, oh, we need to save this planet. Why should we support something that's space based? And so I said, because who do you think that is? Uh, It is that's monitoring climate change and who's actually monitoring the polar ice caps. How do you how do we know all of this? Where you know, and and she said, well, can you put something together to help me? like basically convince people that space is a value to that. So I wrote this one pager that was about all the ways that space, just a broad one pager about all the ways that space contributes to giving back or, or mm. being able to show us what we need to fix, such as monitoring, you know, the polar ice caps and the way that we monitor the oceans in partnership with NOAA just the basic overarching ways. But then I also talked about how space technology is just something that we use every day, not only our cell phones, which is the most obvious thing, but even this, this video communication of doing a Zoom is all came out of the space program. And it's just stuff that we take for granted all the time. Um, So we made the gala um, mission or the, or the theme space for a better world. But then, you know, people were like, Oh, don't be talking about climate change at the gala. Don't be doing this and that, you know, that's not what we should be focused on. So we had it as the theme, but we didn't really go that deeply into it in, in the actual content of the gala, but we both really have a shared, you know, mission in life, I guess, about trying to do something, things that benefit people in the planet. So we made a conscious decision after that to try to figure out things that we could do for a better world. And then that's how the bigger, broader, for a better world um, brand came together. But obviously I lead space. Space, I'm the space cadet. I'm the one who has the relationship (laughs) with the uh, astronauts. And also I'm the one who has the knowledge and the experience and all of that. And so that's why I lead it, even though we work on it together. Um, I lead space for a better world. And I, I have a broader mission beyond just even like the awareness, which is I really want to try to do my part into raising aware, uh, uh, inspiring people about space and the way that they can be a part of space and hopefully also educate people in the process of ways space is a valuable thing for the whole world, not just for NASA or for America only, um, ways that space can contribute to the whole world. What kind of activities are y'all going to do and what kind of charities are you guys supporting? So the first activity that we've actually doing now as a real tangible thing is zero gravity flights that came out of, um, zero gravity coming zero G Corp coming to me and asking me if I wanted to help them sell spots. And I said, no, not really. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) But 
if you would let me put together special flights where we could partner with astronauts so people could have this special exclusive experience, but then we could also raise money for charities and do things that have a bigger, bigger mission statement behind it than just people going and paying to do zero gravity flights. I would like to do that. And so I asked Charlie Duke if he was willing to do a zero gravity flight. And then I was talking to Nicole Stott, who I'm partnered with on a lot of things. And she's like, I want to go on your zero gravity <laughs> flight. And so, um, so that's how that came about. But the idea of doing things where people get to experience the wonder or, or the things that get people excited about space, but then we can also uh, raise money for partner charities. So the partner charities are water charity, which basically provides clean water to parts of the world where they don't have access to clean water and forests without frontiers. And they replant trees. And what's different about them, and, and Sophie has a direct relationship with the people who are leading those charities. So that's partially why. But the other part of it, especially with forests without frontiers, which I like because a lot of people plant trees. Uh, a lot of companies and a lot of corporations are getting into the tree planting thing. What I like about Forests Without Frontiers is not only they, are they replanting trees, but they are building relationships with the local local towns to ensure that the trees will never be cut down again. And that not only that, but the local community is also charged with helping to cultivate and, and, and keep, you know, take care of that forest when they replant it. So nice. Yes. So I like yeah. that, that it's an ongoing yeah. thing. It isn't just, let's go plant a tree and forget about it. Let's yeah, make yeah, sure yeah. that they continue to grow too. That sounds amazing. I've seen the, the, the photos of these zero G flights that you, you took with, with Nicole and Charlie look amazing. That looked, that looked like so much fun. And, and obviously Charlie's coming up to 50 years since Apollo 16 and he doesn't seem to be slowing down at all. Do you think that there are things that we can learn, or especially younger astronauts can learn from him and his experiences and everything he does, particularly perhaps his experiences with Apollo? Well, I told Charlie, you know, you're the baby Apollo astronaut, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, you're the youngest of all the Apollo guys. He's like, I know I'm the youngest astronaut and I'm 85 years old. Um, <laughs> what I loved about Charlie um, is when he landed, you know, I was trying to help him with his bags and he wouldn't let me. And he and I was like, these bags are heavy. And he's like, no, the, I need to get my exercise. I need to stay in shape. And while he was with us, he worked out every day and he was saying, I'm back to my fighting weight. I'm back to my same same weight that I was when I was an Apollo astronaut. So wow. he's really committed right now to, yeah, he looks really good. I think he's in the best shape I've seen him. And I, he just has been really committed to working out. And so he's in really good shape when you, I don't know if you're going to, if he's going to be at Space Fest or not, but, you know, I think that he, I, I admire that, that 85 years old, he's committed to staying in shape and, yeah. you know, looking at, I got still got a lot of life to live. I still got a lot of things that I want to do. But you know, what's interesting is the zero G flight that he did with us was only his second zero G flight in 50 years. So he had done one in Switzerland last year with this, um, uh, with uh, uh, Jean-Francois Clairvoy. And that was the first one he'd done in almost 50 years. And even that, that one from the pictures I saw, it looks like they really handled him with kid gloves and he didn't do a lot. Whereas with ours, he was spinning around and, you know, <laughs> looking end over end. And, and I mean, at the, at the end of it, he grabbed me and he said, that was fun. Let's do that again. <laughs> so clearly, you know, he's, he's raring to go, which is awesome. Yeah, that's incredible. So uh, how weird is it to be on a zero gravity flight and a moon gravity simulating flight with someone who's actually walked on the moon? It must be really surreal. Well, so I'm in a weird position where I've been hanging out with Apollo astronauts for, you know, 13 and a half years. So I never was really in awe of them from the beginning, <laughs> yeah. like a lot of people <laughs> would be. Um, so which is partially why I think I got accepted because I just treated them like regular guys, you know. And obviously working with Buzz, the way that others treated me, they either treated me nice or they'd kept their distance for a while. <laughs> but Charlie was actually one of the nicest ones from the start. And Alan Bean, those two guys immediately were like the sweetest astronauts of the Apollo guys. So for me, it's not surreal to be with them because I'm kind of used to being with them now. But I will say on the zero gravity flight, you know, they tell people to lay down. When you're first like when they're they're doing the the going up in the parabola because you feel a lot of pressure on your chest you know you're feeling the g's of going up 
but the funny thing was Charlie and Nicole Stott, they were just leaning against the wall, you know, like, <laughs> like, like nothing. And we're all laying down, you know, and after a while I was like, I'm going to sit up like them, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, definitely I felt like if they're going to, if they can do that, I can handle that too. But I, it's funny because since we did that zero gravity flight too, I've had a few other astronauts reach out, hey, if those guys don't want to do it, we'll do the zero gravity flights with you. <laughs> so it's kind of funny to see how for the astronauts still, it, it's something fun for them to do. You would think that they're done after they go to space or they're like, oh, that's beneath me. Nope, they still think it's fun too. Have you done it, Emily? Have you done a zero gravity flight? No, but I would love, I would absolutely die if I did one. I would love it. Oh I my would, gosh. I, it's a fantasy of mine someday. We'll have to figure it out. Um, we need to get some people to sponsor a bunch of spacey people, fun, fun spacey people to do it. And doing it from Kennedy Space Center is special because you're doing it from the space shuttle runway too, which is awesome. Mm. Wow. Yeah, I've flown above um, unrelated. I've never done a zero G flight, but I've, I've flown above the runway in a plane before, which was really cool because yeah. we sort of did a descent, not, not the same profile as the shuttle, but similar. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. Uh, <laughs> it's like landed in... From space. All right. Speaking of the space shuttle, my next question was going to be, uh, I guess, an add on to Dave's question. He asked about, you know, Charlie Duke and uh, you work a lot with Nicole Stott, who flew on the shuttle and who, who also was on the ISS. What do yeah. you think someone like her can maybe teach Artemis astronauts or just younger people nowadays about, you know, the space experience? And also, she's an artist. What is what do you think she can teach future generations? Well, the thing I love about Nicole, besides the fact, of course, that she's an astronaut who spent over 100 something days in space, is she's just a wonderful human being. You know, she just is a really good person. And a lot of times, actually, now when I meet astronauts I haven't met before, they when they see that I've worked with Nicole, they, they're like, if you're in with Nicole, you're good with me. I mean, that that's what that's quite a testament to see how beloved she is within the astronaut corps, too. She's got such a great story because she, you know, she was an engineer working on the space shuttle um, program before she became an astronaut for 10 years. She worked at Kennedy Space Center. And even she, she said, I would have never applied to be an astronaut if I hadn't been encouraged to do it by, you know, my, my bosses at KSC, because I would have never thought I had that special something, you know. And so I, she, she tells that because she said a lot of, you know, times people think, like everyone has just their whole lives, they've had this plan to become an astronaut. And it's just simply not the case from what I'm learning from some of the astronauts. Terry Wilcutt is an astronaut that I talked to recently, uh, become friends with recently. He too, he said he applied to be an astronaut because he didn't want a desk job. As a pilot, after he had been promoted, he didn't want to be stuck at a desk. So he thought, well, somebody said, go apply to be an astronaut. And he's like, okay, well, yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe that'll keep me from sitting at a desk. So it's kind of funny to see how some of these people who accomplished that weren't necessarily aspiring to do that their whole lives. The other thing that I really appreciated that and Nicole told me recently, and I think is good for people to understand, is she was saying you know, when you become an astronaut, you become part of the process of selecting other astronauts. And she said, I have to tell you, if you've gotten that far to where we're meeting you and you're coming to Houston, we know you've got the resume to do the job. What we want to figure out is, can we live with this person in space? <laughs> and she said, sometimes people are trying way too hard to be like fit the criteria of what they think an astronaut needs to be that they're not just being themselves. We would much rather see people just be who they are. And then we can figure out, is this a person that I can get along with, you know, in a closed, enclosed space. So that was interesting too, because I think that that's good for people to hear. Like if you've made it to that point, just be yourself. Don't, don't try to act what you, the way that you think that NASA wants you to act. That's not going to get you any further you know, because ultimately you're going to have to be who you are. So I think that part of things is really inspiring to hear from someone like her. But I also appreciate her being the artist in space, painting the first watercolor, maybe the only watercolor in space. I don't know if anybody else has done it. Um, and also the fact that she also has exposed me to that many, many of the people that she knows are artists too. If you've ever had a chance to go to the, um, to the museum here in Tampa or in St. Pete, is it in St. Peter or in Tampa? I think it's in Tampa. Mosey? Yeah. It's in St. Um, or it's in Tampa. Had, yeah. 
Yeah, and campus. So she's, you know, showed this whole array of astronauts and engineers and scientists that she knows showing some of this incredible artwork. So I love that she is always constantly showcasing like we're multifaceted faceted. It's not just that's where I don't agree with the STEM movement, by the way. You know, I think that the STEM movement is trying to fit people in a box of the the people the technical people are valuable to the space program or to the technical world and and somehow forgetting that nobody you don't have to be just one thing your your people are many 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 different things and I think that Nicole shows that in a way that I hope and, and I'm sure she wants to inspire people yeah and I I think she does and I think inspiration is such a key part of it you see her popping up in quite a different places and different podcasts all kinds of different things doing outreach projects to do exactly that to try and inspire people about space and how space can help and I think that kind of leads us into the next question on social media there are frequent conversations about why are we going to space when there are so many problems on Earth? So, channel in your inner Nicole Stott and also trying to imagine that you're just doing a small Twitter thread. What would you say to try and inspire people who say that kind of thing? Well, so why should we be investing in space when we need to fix this planet? Well, first of all, I feel that space is the key to solving the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is the 17 goals that they've set by... 2030 to help fix problems. I guess the simplest way I could say it is we're already, space is already a part of the solution. It's constantly part of the solution. And if somehow people like me and other influencers can help put more eyes on the ways that space is contributing to the solutions, I think that more people would understand and support it. So uh, just real quickly, when I went to the World Economic Forum, almost everybody in all these panels I was on was talking about how they were investing in clean energy by putting solar um, panel farms all over, you know, the countryside of their countries. And I asked them, where do you think that came from? And they, they don't know. And when I say that came from the space program, mm. and that, that is a shock to almost everybody that I talked to, which is kind of amazing. And I say, this is not new technology. It's 60 years old. So if companies who are really serious about saving the planet, start looking at space, I think they'll find the solutions with space technology, research development, all of that. So how can people find out uh, about Space for a Better World and how to book a flight with Charlie Duke? <laughs> well, they can go to uh, allforabetterworld.com and then you'll see at the top um, that there's a, a bunch of different things that are part of All for a Better World. But if you click on space, then it'll take you to the space page. And at the top is the, the zero gravity flights with Charlie Duke. The next one we're going to do is Sunday, November 28th is the next zero gravity flight. And what's a little bit more special about this one that didn't happen at the last one is after we do the flight, we're, we'll go with Charlie on a private tour of the launch pads at Kennedy Space wow. Center as part wow. of the experience. Nice. What? One of our patrons actually is, uh, is booked onto that, Emily. I think, yeah, Chris. I believe, yeah, right? He was telling me all about it. Yeah. He's so excited. Yeah, I saw his uh Facebook post and I, I had to admit I was a little envious. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, am yeah. he's gonna have an incredible time. That that just sounds crazy awesome. Yeah, and if we fill that flight up, then we may do another date um uh after that. But Charlie's willing to do more as long as he's feeling great. So um so November twenty eighth is the next one. We're about half full already out of the twenty five spots. Um, so we still have room. Honestly, if we could get the Brits there, we'll, we'll fill it up right away. <laughs> I know Brits. you, you definitely would. I, I, I've spoke to a few Brits already who are like, I'd do it, but just, we can't fly at the moment, but hopefully yeah. soon, hopefully by November, that could definitely be a, be a thing. So, uh, hopefully but I think will. we'll do it in the, in the spring again with Charlie, you know, as long as nice. he's, and, and next year it's the 50th anniversary of his moon landing and yeah. Apollo 17 too. So it would be a. You know, it's a very special time to try to do this kind of stuff with these guys. As the world opens up, are you planning another gala style event at KSC or another venue uh, in association with this? Or is it still too early to say? It's interesting you say that because um, I'm not planning anything at Kennedy Space Center, at least for the moment. Um, however, Charlie told me when we were together that the Apollo 16 crew was the only Apollo crew that didn't get around the world uh, goodwill tour. No way. Because, what? because they were the backup crew for Apollo 17. Of course they were. So yes. They didn't get to go anywhere. So I said, wow, maybe can I, 
can I try to plan some events around the world for you then? So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, I'm working on, um, and I'm talking to a bunch of different potential partners about, of course, trying to do stuff here in the US, um, possibly even starting in Houston, maybe doing something in Florida too, but I'm um, going to London. We're trying to do something in London. We're trying Excellent. to do something in Paris, possibly somewhere in Germany. That's what one of my calls was this morning. And in Italy, uh, we're already talking about possibly in Dubai. I'm talking to this woman in Turkey who is already planning an event in the Temple of Artemis. Wow. Um, and I and she didn't know anything about Artemis and NASA. So I'm trying to plan something that could be kind of a passing of the torch from Apollo to Artemis in the Temple of Artemis in Turkey. That would be um, amazing. I know, I know. <laughs> Head explodes. <laughs> Yeah, this is amazing. That is awesome. And Nicole would be a part of that. We're talking about trying to bring Charlie and possibly Jack Schmidt, if we can get him to do a passing of the torch and have the uh, uh, maybe four or five different uh, female astronauts as part of that to commemorate the ending of the Apollo 50th anniversary is going into Artemis. And so that's that's what I'm just beginning to have those conversations, you know. So our hope is, of course, that the world is most pretty much open by a year away, yeah. um, but that we commemorate Charlie's and and Jack's 50th anniversaries and do it as a passing the torch to Artemis. So, so keep you know just keep an eye on Space for a Better World because that's where we would that that and PurposeEntertainment.com is where we would be posting. And before you before all of that. I'm planning a big event in um, Camp. I almost forgot this. I just got the uh, approval from the city of Atlanta, and I'm going to do a giant earthwork, which is a, a portrait in the grass. I'm going to fill a whole park in downtown Atlanta, Wood Woodruff Park, and I'm going to. Um, I'm not going to announce yet who it is, but we're going to do a portrait of an an astronaut, a female astronaut, for International Day of the Girl, um, as a big public event for about a week, but unveiling on international day of the girl monday october 11th in atlanta so awesome. i'll be announcing that soon too amazing i can't wait to see photos of that from above that's going to be very special now you've teed me up for one final question when you're at kennedy space center recently with nicole and charlie you got a behind the scenes tour of the vehicle assembly building where the core stage of the space launch system had just arrived now Emily and I are going to talk about this later because there were some great shots of this uh, at the weekend. But you were talking about passing the torch from Apollo to Artemis, and there you were with Charlie Duke, uh, Apollo Moonwalker, underneath the Space Launch System rocket core stage. What was that like? I bet that was exciting. It was extremely exciting. It was very cool to see um, that first stage. That's the first stage, right? It's huge. Yeah. It's gigantic. I mean, even even Charlie was like, wow, that's big. <laughs> wow. So we got to go on the VAB, but then they took us in the upstairs and we got to see the rest of it. Um, and they wouldn't let us take our phones up there. So I couldn't really post that. We also got to go in to see Orion. Um, where and we they took us in to where the whole Artemis like team is working on Orion and wow. and um, that's where we had to put the bunny suits on and yeah, go yeah. the whole um, cleaning process. So that was pretty cool. And even the NASA um, Kennedy Space Center people that were um, escorting us said they've never gotten to do anything like that before. Now I have to tell you, I did not arrange that. Nicole Stott did all of that. Yeah, nice. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the night before when we were having our dinner after our zero gravity flight, she said, hey, you guys want to go see Artemis 1 tomorrow? <laughs> and so we're like, heck yeah. Wow. And so, um, so that was just like something that Nicole, you know, pulled together really, really quickly. But like I said, the people from KSC were saying, even we have never gotten to do, go in and see something like this. One of the ladies said, I've worked here for 23 years. I've never gotten to go do this. But what was really cool before we left where um, the Orion capsule was, um, they, we, you know, we took off our bunny suits and all of that. And then as we were leaving, they said, hey, we've got this big banner that we always put like on the launch dates of like all the people who got to come and see this. So they had all of us sign this Artemis banner, which is pretty cool. And Charlie wrote on there, fly me to the moon again. And uh, <laughs> okay, which was very sweet. And I just signed it, the astronaut wrangler, Christina Court. <laughs> Artemis logo. So that was pretty cool That's to be, awesome. you know, for them to include us as well uh, to sign it. So amazing. 
Amazing. And that's a wonderful place to end, I think. Christina, thank yes. you so much for thank joining so us much. once again and letting us know all about this. It, it all sounds so exciting. And I, I really hope that uh, that flight gets full, full soon and then more can happen and, uh, and that we see you soon as well. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. Well, Houston, the beauty of this place is just absolutely incredible. Man, I, I just love Christina. Isn't she great? She's an awesome guest. Uh, she's always uh, very inspiring. Uh, she's always got great ideas and she's always got really cool stuff going on. So it's always exciting to talk to her and see what she's up to. Yeah, I think I think the, the word inspiration now or inspiring is is so true. Like ultimately what she's trying to do is promote inspiration. She said to us afterwards that uh, she thinks it's, it, it's the thing that's missing in the Artemis program at the moment. Uh, she said that there's so much information which is pushed on people all the time about what's going on, but people forgetting to inspire people. And that's how actually this, this becomes thing. And she said that was the, the thing that Apollo did really well, especially early on. And Artemis is potentially missing that. And she's, she's on about trying to get in, get the department of education in America to make sure they're feeding in stories into the curriculum because so many teachers don't know about it. And, Whenever she's spoken to a teacher and said, "Hey, this the Artemis program is important. The first woman is going to walk on the moon." They don't believe. Like they're like, "What? That's not a thing." They don't what? know about it. And, and and she's so on it with all of this and the way she's trying to use big ideas and big pictures to make this happen and big events and it's great. I love what she's doing. I absolutely love what she's doing. Yeah, uh, she's really doing the Lord's work in my opinion because um in the 1960s when we were you know when Apollo was coming together. Um, they really tried to integrate a lot of it into the curriculum. And I know each week they would have a paper. We got it when I was in school still. It was called the uh, the Weekly Reader. And um, I don't even know if they have it in schools nowadays. I doubt it because this is so long ago. But it was like a little newspaper they'd give to us kids. And um, back in the 60s, I mean, it was just chock full of stuff about space. And, it, and you know, that really inspired kids back then. And I, I don't think we have anything... Um, I studied education when I went to college, and to my knowledge, we had nothing like that by the time I was teaching in schools. It, it's just really like a shame because, I mean, I know it sounds dumb, but those little pamphlets, number one, they got us reading, and number two, they had cool, you know, space stuff in it. Yeah. So it was, it was deeply inspirational, and I feel like, I don't know if we need another weekly reader, but we definitely need to bring that curriculum and that knowledge into our programs again, definitely. So I totally think this is awesome what she's doing. It's also like even globally as well. I mean, I I, I get the, the 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 focus for the two of you is obviously on the US side of things, but you know we, when when we spoke to Teasel a few weeks back or a few months ago yeah. now, and and we talked about how the Apollo program was used to inspire countries around the world as well and get get uh, people talking about America positively, but also about space positively, and they they were very keen not to make it a nationalist project, but more of a, a project. For for everyone and that did yeah. inspire people and inspired people around the world and you hear so many stories of events that took place around the world as a result of that and and i feel like artemis needs to make sure they're doing something similar with that as well and nasa need to make sure they're doing something similar with artemis on that because otherwise it's a missed opportunity and i think there's a reason why people talk about Perhaps SpaceX is becoming a bigger player in the world than NASA is to an extent because actually they're really good at putting out things that inspire people or make people think big. And and NASA have got all of those tools to be able to do that. They're just not connecting the dots as well as other people are perhaps at the moment. And and, and that's yeah. why what Christina is doing and, and what the conversations which Christina is trying to start with with people. A really, it's really important. It's really it important, is very important, in my opinion. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree with you. You know, I, I think, you know, when Apollo was happening, I, I really think all over the world, especially during the first moon landing for Apollo 11, I think it was really just a shared experience with the whole world. And it was a victory for all of humanity. It wasn't just for the United States. Yeah. I, I feel like NASA needs to sort of focus on that. Um, I'm going to get into trouble here, but whatever. I was recently at Kennedy Space Center and they painted that Launch America on the VAB. And that's a nice sentiment. But I'm kind of like, we launched a Frenchman and a, and a Japanese man on the last SpaceX mission. So that's kind of weird. And Artemis isn't just going to be the United States. There's a European service module. Um, there's the Artemis Accord, which has a lot of different nations, you know. Yeah. And I don't think 
in the future, you know, whatever other programs, I mean, I'm looking, I'm thinking like a hundred years down the line when I'm no longer here, it's not going to be a one man show or a one country show. You know, if we're going to um, really open the high frontier, I just stole Gerard K. O'Neill's language and I apologize. I totally just plagiarized him, but that's, <laughs> it's all good. I think he'd appreciate it, but if we're really going to do that, it's not going to be just one country or one person or one type of person. It's got to be everybody, you know, and it's got to be with a lot of different nations. We're going to have to collaborate with other people to to do to get to these goals, you know, and I just I just think that kind of branding is weird because we're going to have to work with other countries. Yeah, that's all. That's at, all I'm saying. At the, at the time when you're out trying to get people to promote the Artemis Accords and then when you bring them to the place where that's happening and Launch America is painted over everything. Yeah. Doesn't really work, does it? Yeah, it's kind of a mixed message in yeah. a way. Like, and I mean, it's a nice sentiment, you know. And yeah, it's wonderful that the United States has a has launch vehicles that can take us back to space. Yeah. So that's a great thing. But I'm not downplaying that. But at the same time, I'm like, well, we just launched a French person and a Japanese person yeah. from our soil, you know. And the ISS is a is a collaborative project. It was always envisioned as that. It. It's not just you know we're sending just ourselves to space. So. Yeah, I think it's kind of weird branding, but whatever. <laughs> Arguably more inspirational would be launch humanity or something along those yes! l- those lines. You know, we're launching humanity to the moon. It's more global. It's more impactful. It, it, it brings everyone in. And, and I agree. We, yeah, we've, we've gone off topic there a little bit, but I think, I think they're the kind of conversations which Christina is inspiring. So I think that's great. Yes. Absolutely. Of course, uh, you can find all the links to learn more about Christina and about Space for a Better World and all the other For Better Worlds uh, within our show notes, uh, which you can find in your podcast app. So if you just click on the episode, it should open a page with all the links on, but some of them don't do it. So if they don't, just go to our website where everything is there for every episode, and that's spaceandthingspodcast.com. Okay. And so on to this week's news stories. And once again, there is a ridiculous amount to cover. So some of this may be a little brief, but as always, there will be links to full articles in the show notes. So we'll start with the launches. At the time of recording on the evening of June the 15th, uh, there have been three launches since our recording last week. On Friday the 11th of June, the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, CASC, and I hope you're beginning to learn that one now, uh, launched a (laughs) Long March 2D rocket. That's the name of it. I'm not saying it's flat. It's like a 2D image. It's, that's it. Anyway, uh, it put four satellites into orbit, including a commercial asteroid hunter. Now, that sounds like a Discovery TV show written all over it, doesn't it? <laughs> On Sunday, the 13th of June, Northrop Grumman launched a Pegasus 11 rocket from the underside of an L-1011 carrier aircraft, which had taken off from Vandenberg Space Force Base, putting a secretive space domain awareness satellite into orbit for the Space Force. Uh, this launch is pretty crazy, and it is the first in what is known as rapid response launches which you'll have to do some reading about if you want to know more. So check the show notes. I've put an article about them. Uh, And we also had a launch today on the 15th of June of a Northrop Grumman Minotaur rocket from the Wallops Launch Facility in Virginia, carrying three national security payloads for the National Reconnaissance Office. I watched the live stream of this and it was pretty special. It just pinged off the launch pad. It was so quick. It was amazing. It seemed to get to space ridiculously fast. Very rapid acceleration. So uh, check that video out as well if you haven't seen it. Yeah, it it left the site more quickly than I clock out of work. It's so quick, wasn't it? It was like it was like goodbye. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) that's how I feel when I leave work. So yeah, out of here like that. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> there have been some incredible images coming from inside the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center as the core stage of the Space Launch System rocket was placed on the mobile launcher between the twin solid rocket boosters. Uh, NASA has shared an eight-minute time-lapse video of this taking place, which really just shows off exactly how big the Vehicle Assembly Building is. Uh, this rocket is huge, and yet it looks so small as it's moved through that building. It's incredibly exciting seeing all this come together. Uh, It will be launched later this year on an uncrewed test mission. 
But the fact that there is a moon rocket being put together in that building after 50 years is really wonderful. Yeah, especially wonderful that Charlie Duke got to walk around it. Yes. You know, one of the people that flew the old moon rocket walking underneath the new moon rocket doesn't get much better. Anyway, meanwhile on Mars, the Ingenuity helicopter was back in action on Tuesday the 8th of June with its seventh flight on the planet. And it's its first flight since it experienced some anomalies which we talked about before on May the 22nd. And the good news is that there were no problems this time round as it travelled 106 metres or 348 feet south of its previous location in a 63 second flight. And the Perseverance rover has now finished all of its health and instrument checks since it landed back in February. God, that seems like yesterday. Crazy. Yeah. And now has started its own science campaign, which will see it explore the Jezero crater and collect and store some samples, which hopefully will get collected and returned to Earth on a later mission. We've also seen a really wonderful self-portrait of China's Zhurong rover standing next to its landing platform. It, this is a beautiful picture. And Zhurong really does look incredible almost like pixar's wally uh it's really got a personality and you can really see it well i always say things like that but yeah it feels like <laughs> it has a personality uh it took the photo by dropping a camera which is attached to its belly about 10 meters away from the landing platform uh before striking a pose uh you've got to check this photo out if you haven't seen it already it's really something special yeah it's really awesome on uh, Saturday, June 12th, the final part of the auction took place for a seat on board the first crewed launch of Blue Origin's new Shepard launch vehicle. Uh, the final price was $28 million. Uh, just change, yep. pocket change. Yep. Although, <laughs> although we don't currently know who it was who placed that incredible bid. This money will go towards Blue Origin's nonprofit foundation, Club for the Future, which is trying to inspire young people to pursue careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The winning bidder will be joining Blue Origin and Amazon founder Jeff Bezos and his brother Mark, and one other person who has yet to be named on the suborbital flight plan for June 20th, in a flight which will last about 10 to 12 minutes from Blue Origin's launch site near Van Horn in West Texas. Who do you think it's going to be? Uh, hopefully me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully somebody bought me a ticket because I couldn't afford that. So we'll, <laughs> we'll see. I think I signed up. It's funny. I think when a uh, Blue Origin announced they were doing cr like a uh, crude flights a while back, I think I signed up for more ticket information, and they never got back to me. <laughs> they probably saw a picture of me and they're like, "You're a dumbass." So they probably just did not even. Uh, Jeff, I'm waiting for your email, buddy. <laughs> If you're listening. Plot twist. The fourth seat is actually going to Richard Branson. <laughs> Could you imagine? <laughs> Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. That would be hilarious. But anyway, while we're talking about space tourism, Glav Cosmos, which is the marketing and international management part of the Russian space agency Roscosmos, has been advertising for potential customers to hire a Soyuz rocket to go on vacation to the International Space Station. Although, this comes in the same week as Russia has once again threatened to leave the space station in 2025, this time because the United States has sanctions against the Russian space sector. The Director General of Roscosmos has claimed that Russia cannot launch some satellites because the US forbids his country from importing some microchips which are required. This story, I feel, has got legs. Yeah. Uh, and we're we'll, interested to see what happens, especially as tomorrow, as we record, uh, President Biden is meeting with Vladimir Putin um, in Switzerland. So I wonder if this will get brought up. I'm maybe not the space program in particular, but I imagine the sanctions definitely will be. Also, literally, whilst we're recording this, I've just seen a headline pop up that NASA has announced that it wants proposals for two private astronaut missions to the space station. Now, I haven't gone any further to this, but I wonder if this is a direct response to the fact that Glav Cosmos are, are looking for people to hire a Soyuz rocket. It certainly seems conveniently planned. Yeah, sort of a, a competition almost. Yeah, I hope, I hope not. I hope not. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's like a day between the announcements, which is pretty crazy. Which is odd, yeah. All right. Meanwhile, uh, the European Space Agency, or ESA, uh, did announce that they are also going to send a probe called Envision to Venus to join the two NASA spacecraft, Veritas 
and DaVinci Plus, which we talked about last week. The European mission will concentrate on regions that are quite small called Tesserae, uh, I think that's how you say it, which are often described as the Venusian equivalent of our continents. Uh, the plan is to try to find out uh, what they're made of to determine if there was once water in the planet's mantle. By 2030, we're going to be getting so much data back from that planet. And what a time it is to be a planetary scientist. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And how great of a word is Venusian? Yes, that's so cool to be able to say that again. <laughs> that's such so a great cool. word. I, that's not something really any of us have said for a while. Like, yeah, because I was thinking about it. I'm like, God, Magellan was such a dang long time ago. Like, that was in the 80s and the early 90s. So this is going to be really exciting. I mean, I'm so excited to see what, what we get back. Me too. And uh, literally, again, while we've been recording, this is also just, just broken. This news is broken. So Brazil has uh, now signed the Artemis Accords. It's the first South American country to have signed up. Three weeks in a row, we've had uh, a different country sign these Artemis Accords, which is it's great. It's great to see more countries getting involved. Still no China or Russia, and that's unlikely, I think. But I think yeah. this is really important, as we were just talking about how important it is that the world feels like they're part of Artemis or the next moon mission, whoever it is that's doing it. Yep, absolutely. And that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. And a big thank you again to our Patreon subscribers and anyone who has purchased any merchandise from our website. It really does help us out massively. You can join our Patreon by visiting patreon.com forward slash space and things. And our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com, has all the merchandise on. So please do go and check those out. If you are willing and able, it really is very much appreciated. And thanks to all who clicked the share button as well. It's great to see. We'll be back next week. But in the meantime, don't forget that in space, no one can hear you mean. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions. <laughs>